Hi, welcome back to Oak Haven. Uh, a lot's been happening in the woods in the last few weeks and uh, we wanted to share with you what was going on. Uh, the, the canopy is closing in, spring is ending, summer is coming on, so there's a lot less light that's getting to the forest floor. A lot of the spring ephemerals have, have gone. Uh, they're setting seed right now. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the ramps have lost their leaves and the flower stalks are up. So we're going to walk around and see what we find as we're walking around. Whenever we walk around, we will stop for a moment to, to weed because you always have to weed the woods. So this is uh, honeysuckle. So we're always trying to keep honeysuckle. We've cut most of the honeysuckle out, but there's always small little sprouts. Honeysuckle, we just um, weed and then toss on the ground, try to toss it in a place where the roots will be exposed to the, the air and will, um, will dry out. Uh, that's our goal. So we walk along, we see that here's a place that uh, we have a, a pink pin flag. Hey Kimber, how you doing? Kimber's gonna join us and help us find things. We kind of think that we should train Kimber to, tr to find invasives on the property and maybe we could send her off to look for garlic mustard and she could, she could find, tell us where it's at. But that's what the pink pin flag is. One other time we were walking through here, we found garlic mustard in this area. We picked it all as best we could. We bagged it up to take it off the site and we put a pink pin flag in the ground to let us know that we should come back and look for this area. What a dedicated dog you are. Here, Kimber is sitting on this plant here. If you want to come over and look at this. This is Greenbrier, Smilax rotundifolia. Um, it's one of, we've got, I think, three woody green briars that, uh, that live in our woods here, uh, that are here, so that they're, they're woody all year round, so that you can find them and be pricked by them all year round. Um, so rotundifolia, this is a common green briar or round leaf green briar, although if you look at the leaves, they don't look particularly round. The way you identify this from other green briars is it's got very stout thorns with a broad base and it's got a dark tip, and they really do jab you. Uh, the, uh, the stem also is mostly round, but it has kind of an angular um, a, a, a angle. Well, that has angles to it. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. So here's some more honeysuckle. I'll reach in and grab it at the base, pull up the roots, throw it on top of something to let the, the roots dry out. Um, let's see, what do we have over here? It's another common green briar. This is a time of year where there's a lot of may apples on the forest floor. May apples come and you've got the, the individual may apples that are just young, that don't produce fruit or flowers, that, that just one stalk that comes up with its umbrella-like uh, leaf. And then you have some that are two flowers or two leaves which of course when I'm here, we'll look up here and we can do that. Oh, but I'm gonna grab some honeysuckle as I'm walking through. <clears throat> so two leaves, but it looks like the flowers did not set fruit this year. And I'm wondering, we had a really hard freeze into the 20s this year that we would not normally have, uh, that would have been about when the, the honeysuckle were, were flowering. I wonder if they got hit hard I'm sorry, the may apples, the uh, honeysuckle. I was getting distracted by honeysuckle. I'll try not to do that. Here along the path, we can get down here. You can see the buds coming up of wild leeks or ramps that are in bud, haven't flowered yet. It'll have a, a bunch of white flowers on top of it. The leaves are completely gone. At this point, there's too many leaves in the canopy to allow much light down to the forest floor, so it's not worthwhile for these, uh, these leeks uh, or ramps to have uh, their big broad leaves uh, still in place. So they've lost their leaves, um, but they're still going to be flowering here, and they'll set their seeds, little uh, black BB-like seeds. Um, if you want, we've got a whole video on ramps and collecting ramps and cooking with ramps. Um, you can check that out on our, our channel. We have a lot of different ferns uh, on Oak Haven. Uh, probably the most common is the Christmas fern. Christmas fern, like you would imagine, Christmas, it, uh, it, 
is evergreen. There are parts that stay green. The the uh, the sterile fronds stay green all winter long, and will be laying here on the on the um, snow during Christmas time. People also think that it's Christmas fern because it has the uh, frond. I don't know if you can see that or not. Is kind of in the shape of a um, like a Christmas stocking. Christmas fern. Again, you've got last year's fronds here. These are the sterile fronds from last year. And then it comes up in the spring. It comes up with fiddleheads um, and has a whole new set of fronds. The, there are sterile fronds and there are some fertile fronds. Fertile fronds, you can see, will produce spores on the bottom of the leaves. So there's a, a series of those. They, they just produce spores. They don't produce spores on the bottom leaf, leaflets or the pinnae, um, just about the top third. And uh, the genus name for uh, Christmas fern uh, refers to as Aristochides. <laughs> I won't even try that. Uh, but that refers to the fact that the, the uh, sorae on the bottom of the pinnae are covered with, uh, completely cover the, uh, uh, the surface. Uh, they're pretty solid. So this is a a fertile frond, and then this is a sterile frond that doesn't have any of the, the spores. Ferns are different from flowering plants in that they produce spores rather than seeds. They don't uh, reproduce asexually through the spores. Um, the, the, what we think of as the fern, the um, showy part here, uh, produces the spores. The spores go out, settle on the ground, and grow into a um, just a small little leaf-like structure, uh, and then it produces male and female parts. The, uh, the sperm go, swims, actually swims over to the egg, fertilizes, and grows into uh, a new uh, sporophyte generation, this one that will grow up and be obvious and produce the spores again. Pretty fascinating life cycle. Here we have a patch of golden seal that's starting to, to set fruit. They had very interesting flowers a few weeks ago, uh, white flowers that uh, were very showy. Now the leaves are much more pronounced uh, and these uh, fruiting bodies are, are coming in. Kind of a cool plant. Other interesting things in here. Here's the, the black snake root that we were talking about earlier um, in bloom. It has these yellowish flowers, a whole little cluster of yellowish flowers. This is actually called um, clustered uh, black snake root. It's interesting, out of this little cluster of flowers, there is, you know, a dozen or so little florets. Um, most of them are just producing stamens, the, the male flowers, and then there's like two or three that are complete that will have both the male and female parts. Uh, so there's lots of pollen produced and not very many seeds. Not sure exactly what the benefit is of producing a lot of pollen over a lot of seeds, but that's the way it works out. We have a number of things here. Um, this is one of the other woody smilaxes or green briars that we have. Uh, green briars are divided into two different categories. There's those with spines and those without spines. So uh, this is bristly green briar, and if you look at the stem, I'll, I'll put a, a, a still image of what the stem looks like. The bristles on bristly green briar are very small and very weak. Well, it looks kind of dangerous along the stem. They don't even stick into you, but there's definitely bristles there. Uh, you'd tell this one from the third one that we have, um, which is uh, Smilex glauca, uh, which has a, a whiter uh, underneath surface. Uh, but that's a bristly green briar. And behind it over here, we have uh, a pretty common water leaf that we have on the property. The water leaf part of it doesn't show up as much now. In the spring, these leaves come up and they're very mottled. They look like they've been, have water spots on them. So this is large leafed water leaf. Um, it kind of, it's, has hairy stems, has these white flowers rather than pink flowers. The flowers really are astounding if you look at them up close because each of the, the filaments on the stamens is feathery. So it looks, I, we looked at this before and thought, boy, it looks like a firework going off with all of the 
the stamen sticking out, and each one of them has this feathery appendage on it. Um, very pretty. This is different from Virginia water leaf, which is probably more common. Uh, Virginia water leaf has more uh, dissected, uh, more sharply angled um, uh, sinuses in the uh, in the leaf. One of the other invasives that we uh, worry about here, besides this honeysuckle that we've obviously cut down and is dead here, laying on the ground, is this plant in the background that's growing up and wrapping around the honeysuckle. This is Chinese bittersweet, very invasive, grows up, chokes out trees, um, very pretty. It has a, a pretty um, fruit that uh, has a yellow capsule and when it opens up it uh, has bright red fruit on it that's uh, uh, very decorative but uh, very invasive. So we try to get rid of this whenever we can. It's got, generally it has these very roundish leaves often has these roundish leaves that come to a quick uh, point at the end, so it looks different. So yeah, I would call that kind of an accumulate tip to that leaf. So here's a delicate little flower that's kind of fun. Down here, blue-eyed grass. I mean, it says grass, but if you look at the stem, the stem is very flat which is characteristic, and here the, the leaves come out, and the leaves are very flat along the stem. That's very characteristic of irises, and this is indeed an iris, kind of an odd place for it, but blue-eyed grass is an iris. Very cute little flower. There's a few of those coming up. That's later on in the, the summer here. So as we're walking around, this area is much more open than a lot of other places. Um, you can see here's the the ramps in bloom. Um, we've got some spider wart that we're going to try to find in more flower later on. But here growing up in the middle of it is our good friend garlic mustard with its seeds forming. The flower is gone, but uh, you can see the seeds. Uh, mustards form in what's called a salik, this long slender capsule of seeds produces lots of seeds that will cause us uh, grief later on. But we'll, we'll pick this up and get rid of that. We'll, I'll stick it in my pocket right now because we didn't bring a bag with us. Here I see another thing that's kind of interesting. Here's another little fern, fairly common around here. This is rattlesnake fern. Rattlesnake fern again has the sterile frond and then it has a fertile frond that comes up that will produce the spores and then the the fertile frond, uh, as the spores mature, will look more like the, the rattle of a rattlesnake, so rattlesnake fern. We also, along with the rattlesnake fern, we have grape fern, uh, which I don't believe is setting up spores right now. Grape fern will send up its fertile stalk from the ground and come up, as opposed to rattlesnake fern, which the, uh, the fertile frond comes up right at the base of the pinnae of the um, the, the sterile frond here. So grape fern comes from the ground is the way I try to remember that. Two G's. Grape fern from the ground. There's a number of grape ferns and, and rattlesnake ferns. Um, we'll talk more about ferns. We'll do that in another thing on ferns. Oh, there's some honeysuckle. Always pick some honeysuckle when we have the opportunity. So spiderwort, something seems to like spiderworts, because you see these leaves where something is like trimmed off the leaves. So I'm assuming that the deer are browsing on it. A lot of them are like that. Um, spiderwort, <clears throat> if you watched our, our ramp video, we talked a lot about monocots and dicots. Spiderwort is in the lily family, so it's a, a uh, monocot. The leaves come out and all of the veins run parallel like that. Uh, the flowers are in threes. It's setting fruit. This is Virginia, uh, Virginia spiderwort. Here's a little flower on a prickly stem. Um, this is common dewberry. The flowers are kind of all by themselves. It's, uh, it's related to the raspberries and the blackberries, um, but uh, the flowers are more solitary like this. It's also, it tends to just kind of grow along the ground. It doesn't form big 
uh, arching canes. There are definitely thorns along here, um, again, but not really thorns that really cause you a whole lot of grief. Uh, they'd be a little uncomfortable as you as you drive by, or drive by as you walk by. Um, it has a compound leaf with three leaflets. I guess occasionally it'll have five, but generally you can see here it's got these three leaflets. So that's common dewberry. So just over from our dewberry, this is this is called wild licorice. I have not been able to figure out why it's called wild licorice because it doesn't. To me, it doesn't have any smell of licorice to it or anything. Maybe the roots do. Um, it's a bed straw, a gallium. So you can see the flowers are starting to form in these leaflets or in these uh, in these whorls of four leaflets. <clears throat> uh, while licorice has four leaflets in a row here, as opposed to some of the other bed straws, they will have different amounts. Actually, if you look over here against the tree, you can see this bed straw has six leaflets running around. Whoops, not very good. Um, so this is a different uh, gallium species <laughs> that wants to fall over now. Um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what kind that is. That might be shining bed straw because it does have a, a kind of a gloss to it. So this, as long as we talked about Christmas fern, this is another fern that I think looks a little bit like Christmas fern because I tend to look at it and say, okay, well, it's got that asymmetrical base that looks kind of like a stock, stocking, but uh, this doesn't have it nearly as much. Um, this is spinulose wood fern, and it grows more, it's more separated out. It's not a big clump. And, it, and if you look at the base of it, you don't find any other leaves. That's because this is not um, evergreen. This does not stay evergreen in the, the uh, winter. Um, but, and then the fertile fronds, uh, they're not they're not ripe right now, so we'll have to do we'll do another whole video on ferns uh, because they're kind of fascinating. This is what the the uh, fiddlehead looks like for the wood fern here, which is kind of cool. I think it looks a little like a ram's head coming up rather than a traditional fiddlehead that looks like the head of a fiddle. You know, whenever you're down in the the lowland area here where you can see it's wet, this is a this, this is a, a drainage way. Sometimes this floods. Um, it's a place where you find this plant, which is wood nettle. Wood nettle um, is often confused. People call it stinging nettle because it stings. It has guard hairs on it that are um, along the stem that sting and they, they hurt. Um, so people think of it as stinging nettle. Stinging nettle, the common name, often refers to another plant and uh, a non-native plant that has um, hairs that sting even more than this. Um, but this is wood nettle. There's a lot of it. Wood nettle is an edible plant. People will ha often harvest it, particularly in the spring, and um, cook it up. Uh, cook it up because that makes all of the, the the nettle part of it, the stinging part of it, uh, collapse, uh, and you don't have to worry about the stinging part of it. But um, wood nettle has these roundish serrated leaves coming to a point, and then the prickles along the stem. And actually, there's a, what I was just looking over here, if we could see it, there's a fiddlehead of the Christmas fern that this is kind of late for it, but where did I see that? Here it is coming up. You can kind of see what that looks like. The Christmas fern fiddlehead looks much more like a fiddlehead, but it's all furry. It's got a lot of hairs on it. The Christmas fern has a lot of the, um, the brown scales on the, the base also. So when we're looking at um, bed straws, this is a very common bed straw, and you can see I can pull it out from the ground almost just be from it grabbing onto my hand. This is called uh, cleavers or catchweed, and it is very sticky. Not sticky like sappy sticky, but little little thorns kind of, so it sticks to your clothes every time you walk by. Uh, we should do a whole video on uh, seed dispersal because you can see it's it has already flowered, it's setting up its seeds now, but uh, an animal would walk by, this would stick on them, they would spread their seeds wide, which is, you know, an important thing for, for plants to do is to spread their seeds 
far enough away so that all the seeds aren't right beneath the parents where the parents have their own territory. Since we've talked about a number of ferns, I'll just mention this one because as you walk by it, it really stands out. This is broad beech fern that has this light um, color to it. It's just, uh, I think, beautiful that the bottom pinnae come the opposite direction from everything else. Uh, it's got this uh, shield look, uh, very cool looking fern. Over here you can see the Christmas fern with the old last year's leaves very obvious here and then the new leaves coming up. Here we have uh, baneberry. I wish it was in bloom. This is white baneberry or doll's eyes. You can see that the, the flowers have already fall, fallen off and it's going to set fruit. Doll's eyes set these amazing white fruit with a black uh, dot in the middle of it looks like a doll's eye. Uh, baneberry, because uh, it's poisonous, the bane comes from poison, um, but uh, just a, a beautiful, good quality woodland plant. We're kind of going through a pawpaw patch right here. The pawpaws, um, big native fruit. If you've never had pawpaws, you should try it. Um, people either love them or hate them. I really like them. <clears throat> pawpaws have kind of a pineapple-y custard flavor, um, they're pretty neat. But when you look at a patch like this, there's dozens of plants that are growing up. Um, they're likely all the same plant. Um, pawpaw will send out its roots and then it will send out new, new, uh, new shoots from the roots to create these patches. Unfortunately, pawpaws will not self-pollinate, so they won't pollinate themselves. The, uh, so when you have a, you can have a big patch of pawpaws and they're all flowering, but they can't uh, fertilize the same flower and they can't fertilize their daughter flowers or sunflowers or whatever you want, sunflowers, that's a bad way to phrase that. They can't um, fertilize for their, their offspring either. So to get actual pawpaws, you need to have pollen coming in from other individuals. Um, people will, if you're trying to grow for pawpaws, they will graft in plants from other, uh, other individuals so that they will be blooming and you'll get flowers from different individuals that will bloom at the same time uh, and allow that pollination. Or you can inter, uh, interplant with other, other plants. We don't get a lot of pawpaws, unfortunately, because we haven't gone through the effort of doing that. Um, we have a lot of big patches of pawpaws, but we'll have one big patch of a pawpaw here, which is one individual, another big patch of a pawpaw over there, which is another individual, and they don't seem to meet. So, well, I think we're going to call it good for today. Thank you for watching. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, we saw some interesting things. Uh, the woods is changing daily. So if, uh, if you're interested in seeing more about what's going on, uh, we would appreciate you subscribing. You'll be notified of when we uh, post new videos. Uh, we'll post individual uh, species individu uh, videos and, uh, and some more walks like this where we're just covering a number of different topics. But thanks for watching.